This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Last night, we saw the ending of one of the most highly praised shows in TV history, Game of Thrones. And it was, uh, well, I'm recording this before it, it showed, so I don't, I don't know. Hopefully they stuck the landing. The dismount was a bit wobbly. But we're not here to talk about the ending. We're not even really here to talk about the show because let's be honest, there's two types of people that are watching this video right now. There's the people who are all, yes, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones. And the people who are all, ugh, I'm so tired of hearing about this show. I couldn't give a fuck. Which I get, I totally get that. I, I used to be that guy and then my wife got me into it. So this is all her fault. But one thing that is interesting about the show, I've always thought was interesting, is the climate of Westeros, the continent where the show takes place on. And for those who don't watch, one of the most uh, impressive things about the show is how richly detailed this world is. They've got this backstory going back hundreds of thousands of years before even the books start. And one of the little uh, quirks about this world that they've created for this show is that the seasons are completely unpredictable. The summers can last for years and they never know when it's gonna end and then winter's gonna begin. And at the beginning of this show, they've had a particularly long summer, so there are many people who are preparing for an especially long and brutal winter. And winter is coming. Now, obviously this is a fantasy series. You gotta suspend your disbelief just a little bit because there are dragons and zombies and giants and magic and all that kind of stuff. But is there a scientifically plausible explanation for these weird seasons? All right, so it should be said right off the bat, I am not like a Game of Thrones expert or anything. I'm more of a casual viewer. I haven't read the books or anything like that. So if I get anything particularly wrong here, feel free to, you know, correct me in the comments. I say that like you guys have ever been shy about correcting me. But I do think this is an interesting topic because looking at the climate of fictional worlds can kind of give us a better insight into the kind of climates we might see out there on other planets in the universe and even a little bit of insight on our own climate. All right, so let's just start there. Let's look at our own climate. What causes the seasons that we experience here on Earth? And it basically comes down to three things, the tilt of the Earth, the elliptical orbit, and the Lankovich cycles. The Earth tilts at about 23 degrees, which is the main reason we have these yearly seasons. So at one part of the year, the Northern Hemisphere is more facing the Sun, and then it rotates around the Sun, and at that point, the Southern Hemisphere is more facing the Sun. And that's why it's summer in the Southern Hemisphere in December and January. This is pretty basic stuff. You probably learned it in grade school. As for the elliptical orbit, um, that actually plays a very small part in our seasons, our, our orbit is almost perfectly circular. It's only very slightly elliptical with the perihelion uh, actually occurring usually when the Southern Hemisphere is facing the sun. So that's why the Southern summers are a little bit warmer than the Northern summers. And lastly are the Milankovitch cycles, which are named after Serbian geophysicist and astronomer uh, Milutin Milankovic. I think I got that right. He proposed this back in the 1920s. And these take into account different variations and precessions in the Earth's tilt and orbit over thousands of years, which change the climate over time. For example, the Earth's tilt tends to sort of wobble a little bit over thousands of years, which can lead to various different periods of ice ages. But these changes occur over long, like geologic time spans, nothing you would experience in a one human lifetime. Of course, the yearly seasons that we experience here on Earth are kind of what defined the year for us back in the day. You know, we actually changed the calendar over and over again so that it matched the seasons. And this kind of makes me wonder in Game of Thrones, how do they know how long a year is if the seasons last multiple years? I don't have an answer to this, I'm seriously asking. So anyway, with all that in mind, let's jump into what could be causing the long-term and erratic and unpredictable seasons that they see in Game of Thrones. Scenario number one is that the planet is simply in a highly elliptical orbit around a star. And when I say highly elliptical, I mean compared to Earth's nearly circular orbit. So just by a few degrees, if it was like highly elliptical, like a comet or something like that, then the temperature changes would be too much to ever support life. But the gist is, yeah, it passes a little bit closer to the sun each year in its orbit. And this would work to create seasons, and if it was especially in a further out orbit on, say, maybe a bigger star with a wider habitable zone, it might create multiple year uh, seasons before it came back around. But again, wouldn't they just experience that as a really long year? The bottom line is, in this scenario, the seasons would come and go in regular intervals, which kind of kills the whole Game of Thrones thing, so ixnay on that one. <laughs> One of the many things to be thankful for about the moon is the way it has stabilized our orbit, which is one of the hundreds of variables that has made Earth such a paradise that we should pave over and put up a parking lot. It's so important that a large moon is one of those things that we're looking for as we're looking out for uh, planets that might harbor life. We're looking for a planet with a very large stabilizing moon. Planets without a large stabilizing moon would probably see their axis tilt and wobble quite a bit, which would throw their climate into all kinds of disarray. And the world of Game of Thrones does have a moon, but we don't know exactly how large that moon is and how much of an effect it might be having 
on the stability of its axis. And the mythology in the show says that there used to be a second moon, but it flew too close to the sun and it burst apart and created a whole bunch of dragons like you do. Of course, just like the elliptical orbit, these changes would occur regularly and slowly over long periods of time, so this doesn't really fit the bill. Unless, and, and this, is, this is kind of a weird idea, what if there was like an unbalanced mass inside the planet? Like if the core was slightly off-center and maybe it would get stuck in some different thicknesses of mantle or outer core and then from time to time it kind of gets dislodged and it shifts the center of mass and then the whole planet kind of tilts a little bit differently in sudden ways maybe but i seriously doubt that's something that, that would continue uh for over billions of years for life to form on a planet because it seems like that would either tear itself apart or eventually stabilize one way or another so if that kind of planetary configuration was possible maybe but i highly doubt that that's possible <laughs> Double star systems are a regular trope in sci-fi movies, and they do exist out there in the universe, so figuring out how a planet might orbit around a double star system is a, an interesting thought experiment. And there are three types of orbits that planets could take around these double stars. A P-type orbit involves a planet orbiting around both stars that sort of spin around really close to each other in the center. S-type orbits involve double stars that spin around each other from a great distance, allowing the planet to spin only around one of the stars. And then there are chaotic systems where the planets kind of weave in and out between the stars. So in order for a P-type orbit to exist over time, either the two stars would have to be really close to each other, or the planet would have to be really far away, far outside any kind of habitable zone. Now there's a million different kinds of variations at play here, but if the stars orbited close enough to each other, I imagine the center of mass would stay the same, so any kind of planet that was circling around it would just experience regular seasons just like any other planet. Now S-type orbits get interesting because theoretically if the planet was between the two stars it would be absorbing energy from the other star basically getting twice as much energy as it's normally getting from the other side of the star which would heat it up severely on one side and cool it off more on the other side. And since the stars are revolving around each other the length of the seasons would vary because by the time the planet gets around to its original position in its orbit the two stars have moved in relation to each other. But there are two major problems here. The first is just that even if this was the case it would still be happening on a regular schedule that they could figure out so and the other problem is in order for that planet to have a stable orbit the other star would have to be so far away that it probably wouldn't be affecting this planet in terms of its climate very much now i suppose there's a situation where it's just perfectly balanced so that it does affect the planet just enough that it wobbles in and out closer and further away but still inside of its habitable zone and there's also the scenario that the star that the planet is uh, orbiting around is actually much, much bigger than the other star, and the other star has more of an elliptical orbit and flies in and kind of messes things up when it comes around, but still, that would take place over huge timescales, and it would be regular timescales, so... Like I said, there's a million variables in this scenario. And the last type of orbit, the chaotic orbit where the planet kind of weaves in and out between the stars is almost impossibly unlikely because that's so unstable that the planet would eventually get thrown into one of the stars or just ejected from the solar system altogether. Talk about fire and ice. Aww. Anyway, this is a fun scenario to think about, but ultimately it doesn't matter because there's only one sun in the sky on Game of Thrones. Of course, one of those stars could be a brown dwarf that doesn't emit light, so then that wouldn't have an extra star in the sky. But no, all those other problems would still exist, so never mind. Okay, what if the known world of the Game of Thrones is actually on a moon revolving around a large Jupiter-like planet? And this is actually interesting because the, the orbit around that planet would cause the moon to like uh, fluctuate in and out uh, in that habitable zone, which might cool and warm the planet. And especially if the planet has more of an eccentric orbit, that would introduce all kinds of chaos and randomness in there that would make these kinds of seasons unpredictable. Interesting, but a Jupiter-like planet would dominate the sky, which is not there in Game of Thrones, so... <laughs> we talked a little bit about the axis of the planet wobbling, but what if it was like a crazy 90-degree tilt like Uranus has? Uranus really is the weirdo of the solar system, and not just because it's named after your exit hole, but because it actually has a 90 degree tilt, which means that twice a year, the poles are what's facing the sun. Living on a planet like that basically means you be in day half the year and night half the year, which is obviously not the case in Game of Thrones. <laughs> Eyeball worlds are the names given to tidally locked planets that orbit around their stars, much the same way that uh, the moon is tidally locked with Earth, and we see the same side of it all the time. We imagine the planets of the Trappist-1 system to look like this. This means that one side of the planet is always hot and one side of the planet is always cold, which means you would definitely have a land of always winter. It also means that one side of the planet is perpetually in the daytime and the other side is always at night, which is not the case on Game of Thrones. 
variable stars are stars whose energy and intensity vary over time. These can fluctuate wildly or they can come and go in regular cycles. Our own sun actually uh, fluctuates about 0.1% every 11 years. And there are two types of variable stars. There's extrinsic stars and intrinsic stars. Extrinsic stars are basically normal stars without that much variation in their actual intensity, but there's stuff passing in front of it like gas clouds so that it actually dims from where we're standing. Intrinsic uh, variable stars actually have their luminosity change in various ways for various reasons. So whether we're talking intrinsic or extrinsic, there's plenty of evidence that stars can vary their output in random and chaotic ways. Obviously, if it's in extreme ways, it would be too extreme for life to form. But there's nothing saying that a star couldn't, you know, vary randomly but mildly enough for life to survive. So this could be a thing. However, this would require the planet to have an almost vertical axis so that it wouldn't tilt and create seasons. And, and that this is possible. Venus is only like two degrees and Mercury's is like 0 0.03 degrees. So this could be a thing. The last one I'll talk about here is by far the most boring, but probably the most plausible. And that is pure and simple, just weird geography. Weather and climate cycles are some of the most difficult things to accurately predict. There's just so many variables involved. Ocean currents, evaporation cycles, feedback loops, the list goes on and on. I mean, here on Earth, we've had random climate fluctuations spring up from just regular natural phenomena, you know, from ice ages that last for thousands of years to ice ages that last for just a few years. So much of our climate is based on ocean currents. In fact, one of the big concerns that they have about Arctic warming is that it might shut down the North Atlantic current. This is the cycle of water that flows around the North Atlantic, basically a giant conveyor belt, bringing warm water up from the Caribbean along the coast of North America, where it cools and sinks, then swings back around down Europe, where it actually increases the temperature there up to 10 degrees Celsius. This is also known as the thermohaline current because it's partly about temperature and it's partly about salt. As the water warms in the southern part of the hemisphere, uh, the water evaporates and that increases its salinity. And then when it goes up north and it cools, it goes down into these chimneys into the lower depths of the ocean and it continues there for a little bit until the salt content kind of equals out and then it comes back up again. What they're worried about is if too much of that fresh water that's locked away in the Arctic ice melts down into the ocean, it could sort of desalinate those currents, preventing it from sinking down and shutting down the current altogether. This would prevent all that warm water from traveling north and cause some extreme cooling, possibly leading to another ice age. Perhaps the world of Game of Thrones has a particular, you know, ocean geography that shuts down a thermohaline current at regular but unpredictable intervals that leads to long and brutal winters. Yeah, it might just be that simple. Or it might just be magic. Because, you know, magic. Or it could be a combination of any of these things that I talked about. It, it's, it's all possible. And this isn't uncharted thought territory. There's an actual scientific paper that was released by actual climate scientists on April 1st, 2013. Yes, April Fool's Day, uh, where they covered this in depth. You know, it might have been a joke, but they took the subject very seriously and applied their, you know, climate equations to it and everything. There's a link to it down in the description if you want to check it out. It's pretty cool. And by the way, I do think that looking at Game of Thrones through the lens of climate is very appropriate because I've always thought that the show in general is a metaphor for climate change. You know, the whole various powers jockeying to control the world while there's an existential threat looming out there that nobody's paying attention to or taking seriously. You know, it's, it's, it's not even a thinly veiled metaphor. It's right on its sleeve. There's a fantastic scene in season seven where John is upset and frustrated because nobody believes him and nobody's taking seriously the threat of the Night King and the White Walkers and all that. And Tyrion's response, I think, sums things up nicely. How do I convince people who don't know me that an enemy they don't believe in is coming to kill them all? Good question. I know it's a good question. I'm looking for an answer. People's minds aren't made for problems that large. White Walkers, the Night King, Army of the Dead. It's almost a relief to confront a comfortable, familiar monster like my sister. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of human nature to focus on small, inconsequential problems when faced with big, giant ones with no simple solutions. The show may be ending, but hopefully this message lives on. We are lucky to live on such a stable planet, but it's not infinitely stable. At some point, we've got to put our petty squabbles aside and face real grown-up existential problems like climate change or any of the other number of, you know, great filters we seem to be putting in front of ourselves. Because it's up to us. There ain't no aria to save us. The weather patterns and climate loops that we experience on a daily basis are really just physics at work, and they affect our daily lives. 
And if you want to have a better understanding of how physics affects your everyday life, you can check out the Physics of the Everyday course on Brilliant.org. You know, true story, this is one of my favorite courses on Brilliant because it really shows you the physics behind the things that you encounter every single day, things that you take for granted and never think about, like refrigerators. It, it, it shows how that works and it gives you a whole new understanding of the things around you. And really, this is what Brilliant does best. They don't just teach facts, they teach problem solving. So you can think like a scientist and apply that thinking to all areas of your life. And with their new daily challenges feature, you can get in the habit of learning something new every day for consistent, steady growth. And you can do it online and offline now, which is great for traveling and those times when you're just, you know, out of pocket. Viewers of this channel can get free access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers, and the people who sign up for their premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses can get 20% off your subscription for life. Because the night is dark and full of terrors, so don't be unprepared. <laughs> Go to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Link is down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are keeping the lights on around here, helping me build a team, supporting each other. We got a great community going on. Uh, there's some new names I need to murder real quick. We got uh, William Dean Harris, Ronald Edwards, Tote McD, uh, Lucas Jeremy Sabin, uh, Kyle Hennenfield, Anya Kyle Taylor, Nigel John Bennington, M. Mostagur Bulin, worst one ever, uh, Bjorg, <laughs> Borge, Johansson, William Swenson, Anthony McHale, uh, Joshua Davis, Ronnie Smith, and Stephen S. Got some really bad ones there, <laughs> but thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos and access to the Discord server and everything that's going on there, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, we got a video right here that Google thinks you'll like, so you can go check that out and maybe check out any of the other videos I got going on. And if you like them, I invite you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. And t-shirts available at the store with answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. I've never had a more appropriate video to wear this shirt and I'm glad I wore it. So this, this is a little bit about SpaceX and a little bit about Game of Thrones. You mix a couple of things, people get the joke and they think you're cool. So there's a lot of other shirts there. Uh, you can go check them all out, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. All right, with that, I'm gonna leave you. Thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys, take care.